given the fact that even back then we still had our families together, communities were stronger back then. That's not even true, though. Like, what? The moment that you interrogate the opinion of, like, any American voter, it doesn't have to be, like, a like a black Republican. Just, like, any American voter whatsoever. You dig one layer deep, and it's just gonna immediately implode, okay? Black conservatives are everywhere. That's why I'm here to show my support as a black man for Trump. Pollsters can't get enough of them. The historic levels of support the Republicans are getting from black folk under Trump. Donald Trump is cozying up to them. Come here, let me give you a hug. And the RNC was full of them. President Trump, we have the greatest economy in our lifetime. America is not a racist country. Can you imagine President Donald Trump coming to a city and calling a pastor like me? You've probably heard a lot of people talking about black Republicans, but I spent all of the RNC talking to black Republicans. So it is with being a black conservative. I, I equate it to being gay back in the 50s or 60s. You didn't come out the closet then. And so you look at the, the people who are really saying that about Trump. It's not. I think there's something really funny about saying that like being a black conservative means you have to stay in the closet and like hide that you're a black conservative. I've literally never met a black conservative that doesn't telegraph that they are a black conservative. That That is straight up. I'm sorry. No disrespect. But like that statement right there is the funniest thing you could say. There's never a moment like, first of all, just immediately off the top dome, worst fade you've ever seen, not even a fade at all, okay? Um, the fits are out of control. It's just like, even from a, from a judging a book by its cover standpoint, you just immediately know, okay? And if you don't know, much like a vegan, a black conservative will tell you that they are a black conservative, okay? So it's not like, like even if you miss the mark on the aesthetic front, you will hear it. Okay, it is ridiculous. What a ridiculous statement to make. It's like thinking that there's not a three minute ad break at the top of the hour. There is one. Okay, get used to it. Here's the three minute ad break now. No uppity Negroes. It's Negroes out the real hood. And that's one reason why I'm pro Trump and, and I'm a conservative is because I truly believe in the individualistic approach to I, every single, first of all, <laughs> every single black Republican that is on camera is literally screaming with their fits that they are black republicans okay again hilarious bro is three eight <laughs> god damn Ooh, the problems that we see within the black community or in america yeah i mean here this guy this is my favorite guy this is the guy he's always at the airports i don't know why where is he flying he's like he's like tom hanks in that movie of the guy who got stuck in the airport but at least he's on the plane all the time. He also has like a very annoying vibe. Like he's so f annoying. He's so, yeah, he, he's so smug. He's so smug. It's just as a whole. Black Republicans specifically are some of the most disliked and unpopular political figures within the black community for a reason. I'm pissed. Of the four black Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives, none, zero represent majority black districts. I am royally pissed. In fact, they all represent majority white districts, something they seem to be very proud of. South Carolina is majority white, correct? Yeah, it's still here. My district is majority white district. You're Utah, it's majority white district, correct? Michigan, you're Florida, is your district majority white district? Well, how well, how do we get here? Like, a lot of white people had to vote for it. There is an obvious disconnect, and, and that's what I want to explore today. I wanted to know what draws mm. a black person to identify mm. with this Republican party. Trump has been for black people. Hmm, how'd that happen? Hmm. <laughs> Makes you think. <laughs> Regardless of what the media say for a long time. The Bible say we parents through a lack of knowledge, right? So until you teach the people, that's the only way they're going to learn. So it's our job, me especially as a black conservative, to get out there, get on the ground, and teach these people all about the black conservative movement. And when you look at the movement now, especially right now, 
We speaking, baby. I learned a lot about black Republicans in these conversations. Their motivations, their stories, their goals. These are real people with genuinely held beliefs. Beliefs that I largely disagree with and I told them as much. It wasn't policy, it was white people. Well, it white people, it was- It was, no, 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 let's be very, let's be very clear. It was white people. Let's be, let's, no, no, no. I tried to have respectful dialogue with them. So in this video, I wanna share these people with you. But I also share some of my reflections on the experience of listening to, fact checking, and disagreeing with black Republicans. I learned a lot about black Republicans and I think you will too. So with that, let's dig in. In talking to black Republicans, I found that their most consistent ideological North Star was an emphasis on personal responsibility. For those I spoke to, there was a real value for rigid individualism as opposed to collective progress and identity. Take Topher, for example. He's a Christian rapper, has millions of followers online, and believes, according to him, in an individualistic approach to progress for black people. And that's one reason why I'm pro-Trump and, and I'm a conservative is because I truly believe in the individualistic approach to the problems that we see within the black community or in America as a whole. And you can think about it, Black Wall Street, Harlem Renaissance, all that time, we was doing great. But when the policies came in and started destroying the black community slowly and slowly. Matter of fact, it was supposed to get rid of poverty or at least lessen it, but we have more poverty now than we had back then. I think you'll notice a theme of dissonance present in these interviews. On the one hand, for example, Topher endorses an individualistic approach to solving the problems we face as a community. But on the other hand, he points to Black Wall Street or the Harlem Renaissance, communities that I would consider on the Mount Rushmore of black collective power. And he points to them as times we should look back back on with admiration. And the question is, which one is it? Is it rigid individualism where we get it out of the mud on our own? Or is it about creating communities where we work together to build our collective resource? Okay, don't dig that far, you know what I mean? It's just like, <laughs> the moment that you, the moment that you interrogate the opinion of like any American voter, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like a, like a black Republican, just like any American voter whatsoever. You dig one layer deep and it's just going to immediately implode. Okay. <laughs> there's no, there is no, there's no rhyme or reason. <laughs> Once again, that's just like pure American politics in general. Okay. Versus. What's also interesting is that somehow for him, these communities no longer exist because of liberal or progressive policy decisions. But when the policies came in and started destroying the black community slowly and slowly, matter of fact, it was supposed to get rid of poverty or at least lessen it, but we have more poverty now than we had back then. I think it's worth pointing out that this more poverty now than back then line is verifiably false. It falls in line with a theme that people like Byron Donalds have advanced continuously throughout this election cycle. The idea Idea that we were better off in any way during the Jim Crow era. During Jim Crow, the black family was together. That's right. During Jim Crow, more black people were not just conservative, because black people always have been conservative minded, but more black people voted conservatively. It's worth noting that the black poverty rate has been falling ever since black people started receiving civil rights protections. It's almost as if these progressive policies worked. Now, you mentioned Black Wall Street, brother, and I wanna be very real with you. Yeah. Black Wall Street was Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood District, mm -hmm. where black people built their own community, right. had their own self-sustained community, sure. beautiful economy, mm -hmm. making it for themselves, and white people destroyed it. Yeah. It wasn't policy, it was white people. Well, it wasn't white people, it was-, it was No, 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 let's be very- <laughs> Yeah, no, it was policies. Like, for example, um, the policy of taking prop airplanes with, like, Looney Tunes-style TNT dynamite and dropping that Looney Tunes-style TNT dynamite from airplanes, okay, directly on top of Black Wall Street, this, this black neighborhood. Um, that was policy and not white terror, okay? That was policy and not white uh, and not white terror. That was just the terror of white policy. <laughs> what? Hey, let's be very clear. No, no, it no. was white people. No, no, let's it, be, but let's, no, 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 no. It was those white people. It was white oh, people. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, no. In that different. community. He said, he said, bad apples. <laughs> White supremacy is not real, it's just bad apples. Absolutely. Exactly. And so, you know, so, and let me just say this, Elaine, Arkansas, Rosewood in Florida, okay. Atlanta, Georgia, uh -huh. the Sweet Auburn District, North Nashville and Nashville, mm -hmm. in Nashville, Tennessee. Each one of these communities were booming black economies, 
where white people, not in the same place, but it was it was the same group of people every time mm -hmm. destroyed those communities. So you can't say it's policy when these booming when black people do what they need to do and build for themselves and white people destroy it. Yeah. So why is it that you would frame it as a policy thing? I didn't I didn't frame it as a policy thing. You, we, we can rewind it. You, you but said you, did, it was, you, but you said, said it was white people. You meant I, so, I said it wasn't white people. It was those white people. And the reason why I'm saying that is because now we're trying to categorize all white people as evil. No. And what I'm trying to say is back then, because a lot of people don't know this, I'm going to put this on record, Black Wall Street rebuilt themselves after that. Four years after that, Black Wall Street rebuilt everything they had, and they prospered for the next 40 years until policy came in and destroyed it because they decided to build a freeway over their town, and that destroyed So what I'm saying is, if we look at oh policy and, and oh the my cultural God. essence of most things, Oh my right? God. He literally, okay. He, wait, he just described, okay, he's not wrong. It is policy. He's talking about a deliberate white supremacist racist policy that regularly, like, why did the highway have to go through that location? Like, why? Who made this deliberate decision? Okay. Who made this deliberate decision? What the f was that about? It's not just policy, it's culture. I was trying to draw a distinction between the nature of progressive policy, like the Civil Rights Act, or Supreme Court decisions to overturn segregation, and white supremacist policy, like destroying black communities. But the, the subject kept changing. Lucky for you, I actually made a video about Tulsa, Oklahoma's Greenwood District. It was definitely white racism that destroyed Black Wall Street and other black communities through explicitly racist acts of state-sanctioned violence. This is why an accurate, full telling of his not a big deal but you got the two events confused the airplane bombing was the africa family no you're wrong airplane bombings were used in tulsa it was a helicopter for the africa family in the move bombing in 1985 they did use i i'm right they did use airplanes in tulsa it was one of the with the i think they didn't even use that in in blair right i think it was literally the first ever instance of an airplane being used uh, on a bombing campaign on u.s soil i am correct it was also one of the earlier airplanes in general numerous eyewitnesses described airplanes carrying white assailants who fired rifles and dropped fire bombs on buildings homes and fleeing families the privately owned aircraft have been dispatched from the nearby curtis southwest field outside tulsa Law enforcement officials later said that the planes were provi to provide reconnaissance to protect against a uprising. Law enforcement personnel were thought to be uh, thought to be aboard at least some of the flights. Eyewitness accounts such as testimony from the survivors during commission hearings and a manuscript by eyewitness and attorney Buck Colbert Franklin, discovered in 2015, said that on the morning of June uh, 1st, at least a dozen or more planes circled the neighborhood and dropped burning turpentine balls on an office building, a hotel, a filing station, and multiple other buildings. The Africa family was a helicopter. Uh, with C4 in a bag. The move bombing is what you're talking about. That's when the Philadelphia Police Department took out a helicopter and dropped C4 on top of a family that was bunkered in 1985, okay? And if I remember, the mayor said, let it burn, right? Wasn't it the mayor? They did not put the fire out. They wiped out a city block. History is so important. Black oppression and black progress have always had a collective quality to them. Black people have been throughout American history targeted as a group from slavery to black codes to Jim Crow to mass incarceration to anti-inclusion efforts today. But we've also made progress by harnessing the power of collective action during reconstruction and the civil rights movement. And even today during the black owned business boom. From LBJ, that's why you say we have these Negroes voting Democrat for the next 200 years, but all those policies have not done what they promised. Would you agree? I would not agree. So you think we're better off as black people now than we were before LBJ passed those policies? Yo, that's such an embarrassing thing to say. Like, that, yeah, no, like, yes, dude. What, bro, I mean, it's, it's another inherent contradiction when you see a black Republican wear like a t-shirt that has like 1776 on it, which is like, dude, what are you doing? What do you think black people were doing back then? You know what I mean? Like it makes no damn sense. Yes, brother, we, we can vote without the threat of violence. Are you talking about the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Is that what you're describing as, as, as a negative thing? 
I'm not saying the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was, I'm talking about. That's LBJ. I just want to be clear. That's LBJ who you said, were we better off before LBJ? LBJ said, signed the Civil said, Rights Act of 1964. I'm talking about the war on poverty. I just want to answer poverty. that one. I want to answer that specific one first. Was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 bad? Thing? I agree with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thank you. But at the same time, I'm also put like this. I okay. prefer dangerous freedom over peaceful slavery. I don't know what that means. Explain what it means is I would rather, given the fact that even back then we still had our families together, communities were stronger back then, I would rather deal with... That's not even true, though. Like, what? Like, dude, people were getting lynched. Like, what? You did not have access to the same, like, like you couldn't eat at the same restaurant. Like, what? Like, the, the craziest part about it is that, like... Obviously, the criminal justice system has basically repackaged slavery and, and you know, kept it legal, uh, but, but this time under the, the criminal justice system, right? So it still turns out like similar results in general. Um, obviously, there are, is a multifaceted approach. There's a million different reasons why black communities are underserved on top of that. But like, I mean, these were major, <laughs> these were... <laughs> I don't know how I'm like, this is such an insane conversation to have. Like, like the, the notion that like black communities in the United States of America were better off uh, before the civil rights era is, is nutty. With the dangerous free Thomas Sowell has destroyed entire, entire generations. Freedom of not knowing and controlling people with policies as much as possible versus the peaceful slavery of being married and tied to the government. Um, Given Trump's well-documented history of saying and doing racist things. No, he's doing Thomas Sowell. Like, no, he is. He's one. You're saying he didn't read that? He 100% is doing Thomas Sowell. Every single part of this argument comes from Thomas Sowell, okay? 100%. That's where it is. The welfare state uh, separated black families, okay? The welfare state was bad. Uh, it separated black families. It incentivized black mothers to to stay away from their black to stay away from black fathers. All this shit is Thomas Sell. I wanted to know how these black people could be drawn into Trump's political orbit. So I talked to Pastor Lorenzo Sewell. Yeah. So anyone that wants to come to church, they're able to come. So when President Trump called, I thought about it like you calling me and say, "Hey, Pastor, I want to invite a friend to church who has 34." felonies. Hey, pastor, I want to invite a friend to church who is a womanizer. Hey, pastor, I want to invite a friend to church. I was on that Thomas Sowell when I was younger, lol. Oh my God. How the f that's, that's even crazier when you're younger. Like it just makes no sense to me. Like you're going to be a nerd. You're going to be a nerd about like, <laughs> you're going to be a nerd in the weirdest way possible where you're just like reading a black dude defend white supremacy. <laughs> the f does that even happen? Is the question I would like to ask Clarence Thomas. So I can't even shit on you, Chatter, because guess who also got radicalized by Thomas Sowell? Supreme Court of the United States Justice, Clarence, the horse porn Tom, uh, Thomas. Okay. So, you know, that's real. That's real. That's a real thing, which is insane. Who could be a racist? He's the lead pastor at a black church in Detroit that Trump visited earlier this year. <laughs> like they said, black church, the air quotes. <laughs> Look at the church. And he was also a featured speaker at the RNC. To all my friends back in Detroit who are Democrats, I want to ask you just one simple question. You can't deny the power of God on this man's life. You can't. What? Being raised in a hyper-Christian school does something to your brain? Yeah, but like, what do you mean? There's, there's, there's a lot of like very religious black folk. They don't operate like this at all. If you've ever been to a black church, actually, not this one, not the one that he's uh, leading, you will notice that like black churches, at least the ones I've seen and the ones I've been to are very political. Okay. They are, uh, a, a organizing ground, especially in the South for the democratic party, specifically the democratic party takes advantage of that quite a bit. Okay. And black churches in general are incredibly political and also their politics are pretty awesome usually i guess all churches are pretty political when it, when you think about it especially in the united states of america specifically black churches are political in a pretty good in a pretty solid way usually and to 
testify that God protected him. Could it be that Jesus Christ preserved him for such a time as this? Could it be? Why should black people support the Republican ticket and Donald Trump specifically? That's a good question. You know, what I would say to any black person is this, specifically about the Republican platform, I would say, look, do your research, right? I would say, look back to 170 years ago in this state where a group of patriots stood up and they started that grand old party to stop the expansion of slavery. If a black person said, well, Pastor, Donald Trump is racist, the Republican Party is racist, well, let's play that theme out throughout history. Let's look at who was the party of slavery. Yeah, also, the Republican Party in its inception was like the closest that American major parties have gotten to Marxism. Obviously, it's not the same Republican Party. <laughs> I hate this argument so much. Oh my God. If the Republican Party is the anti-slavery party still, then why is it that the Republicans are the ones rocking the Confederate garb, man? Why is it the Republicans are the ones who are propping up con Confederate statues? Why is it that the Republicans are the ones who are defending Confederate generals and monuments? Why is it that it's the Republicans that are going out to vote and they're wearing the stars and bars proudly while they're doing that how the does that still work like that makes no sense it's like yeah look no further than a blink and that's it like just don't don't worry about it afterward it's so crazy because like was it welfare i think like there are a lot of black republican uh legislators early on that um wrote incredible legislation I think literally welfare as a concept was originally, I think it was a black republic, if I'm not mistaken. I don't want to, I don't know if it was welfare. Oh, no, it was a firm, no, not affirmative action. I wasn't even thinking about that. But anyway, it doesn't matter anymore because obviously it's very different. Southern Democrats led the charge to secede from the union and establish a confederate states though. Yeah, the point is, do you think that post-civil rights, the, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party abide by the same exact values? Like, especially saying it nowadays when, so in the past, parties were more, like, the parties were not as polarized, right? Like, they weren't as firmly committed to a, a almost universal platform. Back then, you had Southern Democrats and Southern Republicans that sometimes would be aligned on similar interests, and... Northern Democrats and Northern Republicans that aligned on similar interests because a lot of the a lot of the party interests or rather a lot of the political interests came from regional uh, economic interests. Okay, whereas now in the modern era, now in the modern era, it's just like Democrats are one thing across the board across the entire country, and Republicans are one thing across the board in the entire country. Like it is no longer it is no longer a regional split, more so just a simple party split. Slavery. Who was the party of Jim Crow? right? Who's the party uh, of, um, you know, the slave cult? Well, well, those are Democrats. Let's have that conversation. Yeah. Political parties being based along ideological lines are more, uh, are a more recent phenomena. They used to be more regional with interests representing their various constituencies, such as yeomen, farmers, or industrialists. Yes. And when you look at when the Senate was um, integrated, those were black Republicans. When we look at Frederick Douglass, black Republican. So that's on the political side. Why I believe that a black American should be willing to look at the Republican platform. In terms of my, convic my political conventions as a pastor, my conviction in my heart. A black woman's womb is the most dangerous place for a black child to be. Oh, so God. if a black American specifically... Wait, does he mean like infant mortality rates or something like is, is he talking about like pregnancy like maternal mortality rates uh for for black women being like disproportionately much higher than than any other race in the country i don't think he's talking about that i think he's talking about abortion right i don't know why i'm being charitable to this man he's simply a black woman my conversation would be give our black babies a chance look at the republican party in terms of uh president john day trump this is what i would say don't look at the container, look at the content, right? Don't look at the man, look at the mission, right? Don't look at his past. Look at what your agenda is for your community in the future. Conservatives are leading the charge to remove protections for voting rights, protections for maternal mortality, um, interventions in California, terms of action, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sure. These are all issues that pertain directly to the people 
that I know that you serve in your sure. community. Why should they support the party behind the hindrance, the advancement of the very things that I know you stand for? Sure. Black people that I know, that I represent, that I've had these conversations with, they don't want to be put in a position because they're black. There's not one black person I in know that, that will say to me, Lorenzo, I deserve this position because I'm black. But, but, but I want to, <laughs> you, you, you know that that's not what DEI is. DEI is about fair, fair hiring practices, opening up opportunity, like creating pathways. Like. But you're smart. You're, you're an intelligent man. And those that would say this, I believe they're very intelligent. It costs more money not to hire the person who's the best than to be racist. It actually costs more money. So if you're the best at what you do, right? And I let's just say- This is the coolest, silliest way to argue at the behest of white supremacy because the entire reason for why, the entire reason for why these sorts of policies, including like affirmative action and shit, exist is so that you by force at certain points try to get like the majority white population in positions of power to not make racist exclusionary decisions in hiring practices, which has been the standard throughout American history and still continues to this day through a form of implicit biases that people don't even know they have. You're white. You're more predisposed to hiring a white guy. You're a white man. You're going to most likely want to hire a white man. That's just how it works. Statistically, you have the capacity to overlook other races, regardless of their qualifications. The anti-DEI narrative literally is, uh, is, is built around this faulty assumption that a black person is never as good as a white person uh, when they are hired for that job. That means like if a black person is in a position of power... That means that they automatically disqualified a more qualified white person that should have gotten that position. It's ridiculous. What percentage of the average workplace should be white? I don't know, man. What, what kind of stupid question is that? And it, that's not how this works anyway. Say I'm a racist. So I'm, let's just say that, let's play that out, right? And let's just say, hey, there are 20 white guys that are not as competent as you, but I'm not gonna pick you because you're black. It's gonna cost me more money. <laughs> they don't even know that this qualified person exists, right? That's, sure, I hear the, you. The pathways are the problem. And a lot of what diversity, equity, and inclusion is doing is creating those and helping to clarify those pathways. One of the funniest parts about this is that, like, you know, black people have disposable income as well. They also participate in the economy. So do brown people, so do women. So these DEI initiatives, as a matter of fact, are uh, conducted in an effort to elevate people from different backgrounds to higher positions, hopefully to not overlook them when they are qualified, right? And the reason for why they do it is because corporate boards that have more diversity end up having more profitable corporations. So the real reason for DEI in general is that it's good to have a black dude on the board, okay? because they have an entirely different world experience than the eight other white dudes that are on that board that might be able to see certain things that the eight other white dudes will miss because of their, you know, their, their privilege, their biases. That's it. And it turns out it helps profitability in corporations in general. That's why there's always like, uh, there's always like that thing where we'll look at something and we'll be like, was there not like a single black person in the company at any point that like looked at this and went like, well, this is kind of weird. We probably shouldn't do it. And so framing it as an unqualified person getting the job when we know, you and I both know, sure. that there are plenty of qualified black people sure. or Latino people or women who don't end up with jobs. 100%, 100%, and I agree with you. I, I do think relationships and proximity matter. In his book, The Grift, Clay Kane details the history of how black conservatives have thrown black people under the bus to get ahead personally. From black Republicans like Isaiah Montgomery and Booker T. Washington to modern black Republicans like Clarence Thomas, Clay Kane makes the case that the modern black Republican is likely, if not assuredly, a grifter, a person who is doing that which is politically expedient rather than doing what is right, doing whatever they need to do to get that all expenses paid trip to
I think it also stems from like um, <clears throat> a cynicism that like white supremacy is so ever present and like impossible to combat so that you're just like at least at least I'll I'll get mine like I'd rather because Clarence Thomas is a really interesting person because he's like also kind of a black nationalist too at the same time uh, even though he's all like he has I mean that's his that that's how he started off as originally and he still has some of these like black separatist opinions very weird also has a white wife so it's like it's like odd in in every way truly a truly a unique figure fancy places i couldn't help but wonder if some of the folks i was talking to fit that description so i asked pastor lorenzo whether or not he was a grifter. In my reporting, I've spoken to Clay Kane, who wrote a book about grifters, how sometimes black Republicans will align themselves with political power for their own personal advantage. Sure. What do you say to a person who says, hey, like you're a talented, gifted person, but we didn't necessarily know who you were, but now you're speaking on one of the biggest platforms in the world tonight? Quite frankly, I don't need another opportunity to speak. Have, has the Republican Party said, Lorenzo, we're going to write you a big check? No. If they did, it's just going to go right to the community anyway, right? At the end of the day, because that's where my salary goes. You, you've mentioned Frederick Douglass and sure. others from the 1800s, early yep. 1900s. In those times, black Republicans were elected by black people. Sure. Today, black Republicans, they're elected in majority white districts. Agreed. Why is it uh, difficult, maybe even some would say impossible for a black person, for a black Republican to be elected in a black That's a good community. question. You know what? I wrestle with that. I, I, think, I think the biggest problem is the Republican Party, in my opinion, they have, um, I believe, drifted from their roots in terms of black people having authority within that party. I don't believe the Republican Party has learned well how to support financially those who are black Republicans that want to come out the closet. I, I equate it to what? being gay back in the 50s or 60s, right, or even 70s. You didn't come out the closet then. Like the movie Philadelphia, right? Because you could be ostracized. So it is with being a black conservative. We have been, the, the Lord has blessed our church. He's been very kind to us to really serve our community. However, me just having President Trump at our church, if I could play the voicemail, sir, <laughs> these are the ones I haven't had time to delete. If I could send you the emails where it's like, really? I mean, people that I thought loved me, they're like, calling me everything but a child of God. I'm like, hold on for a second. Can we just have, can we have a conversation? Why are you like, like? How has that made you feel? You know, I'm, I'm, I was a drug dealer. I was a street pharmacist, right? <laughs> Former. <laughs> so the people that you love are hurts. I have to be frank with you, you know, but other people that don't know you, don't understand your motives, I get it. When tensions are high, motives are questions. And tensions have been high in our country as it pertains to politics. So people question my motives, I understand that. But for the people that love you, it is it, it hurts, it really does. And that's the reason why black people won't come out the closet. A relatively small percentage of black people will vote for Trump this November. But I have a take and I wanna share it with you. A more inclusive and racially diverse Republican party could be a good thing. American conservatives and Republicans have made the lives of black people difficult, on purpose. From the Southern strategy to welfare queens to anti-woke, anti-DEI stuff today, American conservatives have galvanized their white base by making the lives of black people harder. It could be a good thing to see more black Republicans if it means that the Republican Party is becoming actively hostile to the racists who have called that party their home for the last 60 years at least. Make American politics inhospitable to racists. I'm all in on that platform. But the reality is that racists, or at least racism enablers, were present and accounted for at the RNC. They were given stage time, had exclusive access. It also happens to be the entire platform of the Republican Party still to this day. Like, that's just it. It is the party. It is the platform. You have two racist parties. At least one is like, doing its very best to mask its racism um in in the in the endless continuation of uh white supremacy and policing in the criminal justice system uh, that is baked into uh, american existence in general and i'm of course talking about the democratic party in that circumstance 
but the other one is actively running on the racism because it looks at the white supremacist criminal justice system and it says this is good and we need more of it we need to do so much more of that actually you are so wrong explain the racism better than just saying everything is racist Ooh, oh buddy where do i begin okay we got two we got two people in the chat one said you are so wrong no 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 follow-up whatsoever the other said explain the racism better than just saying everything is racist the american criminal justice system disproportionately targets black people the american financial system has historically also underserved black communities through legal processes and illegal now illegal ways uh segregation in the south uh jim crow laws in the south redlining in the north and everywhere else okay and this has led to black people having worse outcomes overall on health care, education, job opportunities. Um, and, you know, more importantly than that, uh, having a criminal record. This is what we mean when we say America is a white supremacist nation. Obviously, I'm not even talking about like the long history. I'm just saying last night you blame white supremacy for the no Palestine speaker. Yeah, that is a different form of, of white excellence, white supremacy, America's hegemonic uh, superpower status that comes from destroying the global South, which is comprised predominantly of non-white people, brown people, black people. That is true. That is also still white supremacy. This is foreign policy, though. We're talking about domestic policy, which is like similar to foreign policy in that regard. You can see black communities as like in internal uh, colonies interior colonies it's it's in every part of the system and it ha and it manifests itself in ways that you oftentimes don't even recognize like for example um we now now that like the watchmen and shit talked about it extensively it's a little bit different but back in the day when i used to talk about like tulsa the tulsa massacre there were black people in this community that didn't even know about it why is it a why is it that a turkish white guy is talking about a a important part of black american history to black people that grew up in the united states of america how is it that that's the first time that they heard about it it's because in a lot of in a lot of the curriculum they don't teach it it's like an afterthought it's rarely discussed now i, I think it's a little bit different now but i'm talking like you know six seven years ago that's because American education is still firmly a whitewashed version of events. This is one of the unique ways uh, that you don't even recognize where you are, even as a black person, growing up in a white supremacist system. I teach US history, we do teach it now, but it's not a major focus in our standards. Anyway, this guy that said you are so wrong didn't respond. Does this help you understand it a little bit? Let's continue. Yes, and seems central to the whole operation. And I'll tell you what did not feel central. Black people. I actually attended the black delegate event during the RNC and something really interesting happened. The event was taking place away from the main convention center. And in the middle of it, unexpectedly, former President Donald Trump's motorcade could be heard approaching the event from a distance. People have been having a great time before that moment, but you, you should have seen the excitement on people's faces when they realized it was Trump approaching their event. It really felt like this big moment of acknowledgement, the perfect punctuation in a banner year for black Republicans. Journalists and news crews were scrambling to get into position to make sure they captured that moment when he comes to this event. But then his motorcade just drove by. It turned out he wasn't coming to the event. It wasn't on his schedule. Huh. It just happened to be along his route. He waved at us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in case you didn't see it, he waved. The disappointment for this group of black Republicans was tangible oh. and and kind of poetic. And I think that's my big concern with the future of the Republican Party. The RNC had quite a few drive-by acknowledgments that black people exist, but little to no substantive action plans for how they also, the formative role that black Republicans play 
at the RNC historically is literally to stand there and say whoever the president is is not actually racist. Sometimes going beyond that and even denying that systemic racism doesn't exist as well. That's it. Like, I watch this shit every time. I CPAC convention, like, I watch CPAC, I watch RNC, I watch all this shit. And that's precisely the role that every black Republican plays. That's it. Roll them out as human props to talk about how I'm black. And as a black man, Donald Trump is not racist. That's all black Republicans are there to do, which is crazy. And it has not changed in like the decade that I've been covering uh, politics professionally. They would show up and be present with and for this community. And if I'm honest with you, I think that's on purpose. The only way the Republican Party becomes this ideologically conservative, but racially inclusive big tent party is if there is a fundamental rejection of the people and policy and practice they currently hold as sacred, near and dear to their political vision. As long as the GOP makes racial justice a political issue worth fighting against, a majority of black people will never vote for the party. As long as teaching black history is woke, as long as race conscious solutions to race conscious problems are demonized, as long as they commit to denying racism's impact on society, black people by and large are not going to vote for them. But these guys may and that might be good enough for them. Yeah, that's a good one. <clears throat> I think there's very valid criticism that could reason a black person become a conservative. At least it happens here a lot in Brazil. I don't know if it's going to address it because it's very, he's very lib-coded. What is it? Okay, don't tell me.